Hey everybody, Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust, and we're closing out the coverage of our Remembrance Day 2022 here at Gettysburg in the Peach Orchard. If you haven't yet, please follow us on Facebook, check out our YouTube channel, click that subscribe button while you're over there, and check out everything at battlefields.org. Right now, we are working here at Gettysburg to preserve a piece of land just up the road from where we are, about a half acre, in a place called Pickett's Buffet, um, which is on the edge of the town, and that is uh, plays a, a key role, that piece of ground, during the fighting on July 3rd, during Pickett's Charge. And then later on, it's actually the headquarters of Dwight David Eisenhower in 1918, when he was commanding what's called Camp Colt here at Gettysburg, a World War I training camp for tanks. Uh, but but uh, we're out here talking Remembrance Day, and what we want to do is kind of wrap up our coverage that we've had out here, but talk about where we are specifically first at the Peach Orchard, which is one of our favorite spots while we're out here on the battlefield. We're on the uh, July 2nd battlefield along the Emmitsburg Road off to the west over here. It runs kind of diagonally up into town. It's one of 10 roads running in and out of Gettysburg that would carry the Union and Confederate armies here. Uh, behind me and up the ridge will be Cemetery Ridge. You might see the large Taj Mahal looking memorial and that is the Pennsylvania Memorial, the largest memorial on this battlefield with more than 34,000 names of Pennsylvanians who served here. And then of course off to my left we'll also have the wheat field, Little Round Top, Big Round Top, and some of the other iconic sites here at Gettysburg. But to get us up to speed, I'm going to bring on our friend Doug Ullman. Uh, Doug is uh, going to talk about what happened down on this part of the battlefield, July 2nd, 1863. Doug, take it away. Right, so as, as Chris mentioned, from where we're standing, we can see a lot of the key landmarks of the battlefield. Cemetery Hill is directly behind me, Cemetery, Cemetery Ridge coming down in this direction. Then we have Little Round Top. Uh, the Stony Hill, the Wheat Field, Rose's Woods, there's the George Rose Farm, which is going to be important to us later. We're in the Peach Orchard, owned by Joseph Scherfey. Scherfey's barn is right behind the camera, the, the big red barn over there. And we are, the, and then the road that runs behind the camera is the Emmitsburg Road. And this was one of the main arteries for the Union Army as they are, are arriving on the battlefield on the night of July 1st into July 2nd. And those troops of the Union Third Corps are going to be marching up the Emmitsburg Road as they come to as they come to the battlefield. It's a story that's often told and, and, and retold, but it's worth mentioning again that on July 2nd, George Meade, commander of the Union Army of the Potomac, wants to hold a line that extends from Culp's Hill all the way over to the right, across Cemetery Hill, and then down Seminary Ridge, ending in the vicinity of the Pennsylvania Memorial. He is instructed Dan Sickles, commander of the Union Third Corps, to extend that line basically from the Pennsylvania Memorial to the northern edge of Little Round Top. Dan Sickles uh, is not a trained West Pointer. He went to my, what, what is now my alma mater, uh, NYU, so I don't like to talk too poorly about uh, Sickles, but Sickles is not a trained professional officer like many of the other Corps commanders, and so having been on this high ground, he knows that this is a good place for artillery. He doesn't like the low ground that he's been assigned to over there. He doesn't think his artillery will do any good over there. So of his own volition, he's going to move his entire 10,000 man corps up here to the Peach Orchard and along the Emmitsburg Road and then down towards Little Round Top. Unfortunately, Sickles does not have enough men to man the line that he wants to man. He can't stay connected to the high ground over there and connected to Hancock's second corps on his right without some help. So there are big gaps in his line. And as the Confederates are beginning to start the fighting here, start firing on him, he's going to go to George Meade and say, well, I thought this was better, but if you want me to pull back, I'll pull back. And George Meade says, it's too late. Those people won't let you leave. And so Meade is going to start sending reinforcements to patchwork Sickles line as James Longstreet's assault on the afternoon of July the 2nd is beginning. Uh, we'll have fighting going off to the south of us as men of uh, Joseph B. Kershaw's brigade are going to move their way first towards the Peach Orchard and then by a miscommunication of orders start moving in towards the wheat field and that is when Union troops in this vicinity, men of uh, Charles Graham's brigade as well as some other units in here and the artillery batteries of Bigelow and Phillips Massachusetts batteries are going to start firing into the flanks of those South Carolinians causing mayhem and it all looks good on this side of the battlefield despite all of the the chaos and despite the confusion and despite the fact that they are kind of stretched thin, Sickles' line seems to be holding here at the Peach Orchard. And that is when 
Longstreet is going to unleash the Brigade of Mississippians commanded by uh, William Barksdale, who's going to charge in this vicinity and smash the salient. Let me turn it over to Evan. Yeah, thanks, Doug. So uh, when we're standing here on the Peach Orchard, uh, Doug mentioned the Sherfee Farm. And that's where uh, General William Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade is really going to uh, crash into Sickles' line. And Longstreet himself is going to send off uh, the Mississippians saying, go you Mississippi, and they're going to charge uh, kind of up this ridge and hit the 114th Pennsylvania Zouaves uh, head on. And they're going to break through this, this salient. When we talk about a salient, it's a, kind of a point in the line. So. Sickles line is going to extend northward along the Emmitsburg Road, and uh, Barksdale is going to hit the front or the point of this salient, which is a relatively vulnerable position. So as, as Sickles' men uh, and the third Union Third Corps stream through the fields uh, to my right, Barksdale and his men are going to come up over this ridge. And um, at the same time, General Joseph Kershaw's men are going to be moving through the fields to my left. And uh, General Henry Hunt, who is the um, chief of artillery for the Union Army, he's going to see that, that Sickles still has some gaps in his line when he moves out here. And he's going to send his reserve artillery to plug these gaps in order to, to strengthen uh, Sickles' line. And one of these batteries is um, commanded by Captain John Biglow, which is uh, positioned uh, down the Wheatfield Road um, to my right. Chris might be able to uh, show you. And uh, John Biglow is going to begin firing um, into Joseph Kershaw's flank. And it's, it's actually going to compel Kershaw to break off part of his brigade to face uh, relatively northward to, to deal with this artillery threat. But as Sickles' line breaks and begins to, to withdraw uh, past the um, Abraham Trossel farm where Sickles is wounded and has his headquarters. This is going to leave the ar artillery vulnerable and Captain John Biglow's battery is going to be compelled to, to withdraw as well. But Biglow gives the order to uh, retire by prolong, which basically consists of tying a, uh, a cord or a rope to the, to the end of their, their guns, their cannons, and connecting it to the caissons. So that allows the guns uh, to, con to continue to fire as they uh, b basically pull the, pull the guns off of the field um, uh, on horses. And that's going to give uh, some room between the, the cannon and the caisson so that the cannon can still fire and recoil. That's what the, the, the cord is for. So they're going to make it as far as the, the Abraham Trossel farm where they're going to, the, the battery's going to take more casualties. If you're familiar with um, the Alexander Gardner uh, photographs of the, the Trossel farm, you'll, you'll remember uh, seeing casualties of, of horses uh, in and around the, the farm buildings, and those are from uh, Captain Biglow's battery. So they're going to make another stand at the Trossel farm, and then they're eventually going to, to retreat back toward Cemetery Ridge, um, but, but at a high cost. Doug? Right, so thanks, Evan. Yeah, and Bigelow's battery is, is an example of the bravery that you see among those artillerymen fighting in and around the peach orchard. Uh, you're going to have, at least in the, in the batteries that I can, whose monuments I can see around here, there are three different Medal of Honor, Medals of Honor awarded. There's one to Casper Carlisle of Hampton and Thompson's battery, one from Patrick uh, in Patrick Hart's battery that is, uh, oh, someone help me. 15th New York. 15th New York Independent, I can't remember the guy. Oh, Edward Knox of the 15th New York Battery is going to receive the Medal of Honor for cutting the traces off of his horses so that the guns can escape. And uh, Bigelow's bugler, uh, Charles Wellington Reed, is actually going to save the life of John Bigelow, who was wounded. He's going to be carrying Bigelow off on his horse back towards Cemetery Ridge as uh, new Union guns put in place by, by uh, General Hunt are going to start firing over their heads. So Reed is going to bring his commanding officer off the battlefield and they will both survive. And Wellington, uh, Charles Wellington Reed will receive the Medal of Honor for that action. Once the salient collapses, Sickles' other division under Andrew Humphreys, which is along the Emmitsburg Road facing west, is now in a serious predicament because as Longstreet's assault is now starting to move up 
the Emmitsburg Road at AP Hills. Corps is starting to vaguely get involved in this action. Andrew Humphrey's division is now on its, it has both flanks in the air and has to be put, it has, has to withdraw back across those fields from the vicinity of what we see over there in the background. That is the, the Klingle farm and the beyond that, the Kadori farm retreating from my right to the left back in the direction of the Pennsylvania Memorial and Cemetery, and Cemetery Ridge. Other troops will come up and will stem the tide and the, and the Confederates will eventually have to withdraw and they won't be able to take Cemetery Ridge, but it comes at a high cost and high cost in casualties to the Third Army Corps, which come the next spring will no longer exist as an independent organization, in large part because of the casualties, at least in my opinion, because of the casualties suffered here at Gettysburg. So it's important to remember that this is a key part of the battlefield that is often overlooked because of heroics on Little Round Top or heroics of the first Minnesota over there. Uh, but had Sickles not arrived at this, po at this point of the, uh, not taken his corps out here, a lot of heavy fighting would not have occurred uh, and the battle may not have unfolded the way that we know that it did. So there's lots to remember uh, when we talk about that. And when the sun sets on July the 2nd, this area here, is littered with both Union and Confederate dead, and those are things that we're gonna to have to deal with in the aftermath of the battle. But to talk about that, I'm gonna bring on Sarah K. Byerly. Thank you, Doug. And we are out here and the sun is starting to set in the west here. Um, it has been, it's a, it's a little chilly here, um, but uh, what a great uh, overview that we've heard from Doug and Evan about the fighting that happened out here. And just as I'm standing here listening to the retelling of these battle accounts and thinking about what we've seen earlier today, the, the parade and so many reenactors, so many people in Gettysburg today interacting with history in a variety of ways. And it's really kind of brought home to me this thought about remembrance and why are we here on November 19th? We're here on November 19th because of what happened on November 19th in 1863. And that, of course, is the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery here in Gettysburg. And as we've talked about earlier today, the keynote speaker at that event is Edward Everett. And then Abraham Lincoln makes a few appropriate remarks, um, which become the famous Gettysburg Address, the more remembered part of what happened 159 years ago in Gettysburg. But it was a different feel, if you will, in Gettysburg 159 years ago. Think of it as a large scale funeral, because that's what's happening. That's the dedication of a cemetery um, because you have thousands of dead that have been left here in the fields, in the farmyards um, at Gettysburg because of the large battle in July. And, you know, some of the regiments are burying their fallen. There's accounts of them burying their dead before they either retreat or move, move on, um, advancing from Gettysburg, you know, trying to mark these fallen comrades' graves, putting up headboards to hopefully uh, make sure that those men's names are known and other typical burial practices in the immediate aftermath of a battle. Um, but then time is going to go on and um, weather, there are heavy rainstorms that happen after the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, other factors are going to be uncovering some of these graves and the Gettysburg community needs to figure out a way to deal with all of these fallen soldiers and try to deal with them in some way that honors the sacrifice that happened here in the large scale fighting. So you have some local um, citizens, you have governors of northern states um, kind of banding together, trying to come up with an idea, and the idea of the National Cemetery is born. So uh, the architecture, the design of the cemetery um, organizes these fallen soldiers. They'll be buried by state, but buried um, in a, a sort of circular pattern so that no state is given more importance than another. And um, it's in the fall of 1863 that the disinterment and reburial of these federal soldiers and these Union volunteers who died at Gettysburg begins. And, and it's actually the interment in the National Cemetery has already started happening by the time that the cemetery is dedicated in November 1863. Now, when I talk about Gettysburg history, aftermath of Gettysburg, one of the questions that comes up a lot is what happened to the Confederate dead? Because the no Confederate soldiers were supposed to be buried in the National Cemetery. And uh, remember, this is happening in the middle of the war. So you don't have a reconciliation movement starting yet. And 
the Confederate dead are generally left where they were buried um, in the immediate aftermath of the battle. These graves are often still marked to some extent, or civilians know where these graves are. And in the 1870s, um, ladies' memorial associations from the South are going to make an effort to bring these um, remains of the Confederate soldiers here at Gettysburg and rebury them in cemeteries across the South. There's quite a few of these fallen Confederate soldiers from Gettysburg who are buried in Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia, and there's others um, in other cemeteries across the South. Um, so that's a little bit of what happens to the fallen um, soldiers Union Confederate here at Gettysburg. And, you know, as as we are thinking about what happened as we focus on the remembering, Remembrance Day, Dedication Day, these different terms that we use for this um, this day, it, it happens because of the battle that happens here. And um, the the different ways that honor was brought to the sacrifice to the loss um, that occurred here on these battlefields um, chris doug is there more that you would like to add that we should talk about maybe something we're missing questions we should answer yeah sarah thank you um, you're with the american battlefield trust uh, we thank you for watching please click the like button please uh, uh, be sure to share this as well check out our youtube channel we have the american battlefield trust youtube channel go over there click subscribe you can see all of our great videos and we had videos earlier today here on our Facebook page if you if you missed that. I see uh, Daniel's uh, joining us from Belgium. I was just uh, over in Belgium a few days ago over in Ypres. He was saying how there seems to be more Europeans on here right now than there are Americans. Um, someone's asking about Gary. They're worried about Gary. I'm worried about Gary too, just in different ways probably. Uh, but uh, Gary's on his way to Paris right now, so he is not with us. He's taking a vacation and he allowed us to come play on his battlefield. Uh, so we're up here with him and we have some first time viewers. Uh, so we really thank you for, for uh, watching and, and, and supporting this. And Sarah brings up some, some great points. Now the, the Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is really the reason we're up here today. Uh, we call this Remembrance Day because we're up here uh, commemorating the Remembrance Day Parade that was over on our YouTube channel. Um, we covered that. That was at 1 o'clock. You can go watch it on YouTube. But really, this is Dedication Day, the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery here in Gettysburg. And um, the, the cemetery itself contains more than uh, the remains of about 3,500 soldiers um, who fell around Gettysburg. The designer of it is uh, William Saunders, who was in charge of the agricultural department uh, during the time of the American Civil War. He goes on to create the Grange. Um, and he sets up, as Sarah pointed out, a cemetery that was supposed to be a little bit more inclusive, uh, kind of putting core by core, the first core troops here, the second core, the third core, which would have mixed up the states of, of troops. But the governor of Massachusetts did not like this idea. He wanted to have Massachusetts men with Massachusetts men. And so the uh, 18 northern governors got together and decided that that's how they wanted to put together the cemetery. There's 22 plots in there. You say, hey, there's 18 northern states. Why are there 22 plots? Well, you have 18 plots for the states. Then you have a 19th for the United States regulars, the regular army. Then you have the other remaining sections of unknowns. So they all are in a semicircular um, uh, layout around a large memorial that was dedicated by uh, George Gordon Meade. He was here in 1865 to help lay the cornerstone. And then, of course, we have the Kentucky Memorial that would be up there as well. So if you go up into Soldiers National Cemetery, it's a park-like setting, and that's exactly what William Saunders wanted so that people could come back here, sit down, have a picnic, remember those people who were here and who came before them, loved ones, fathers, sons, brothers, uh, up in Soldiers National Cemetery. And uh, as Sarah pointed out as well, we have the Confederate dead that are out here as well. And we have uh, uh, men like uh, Dr. O'Neill, who we talked about earlier in another uh, live video. Check that out over on our Facebook channel. Uh, he helped to document the Confederate dead. And then we had Rufus and Samuel Weaver, who then are contracted by ladies' organizations to ship the bodies back to the South um, and to have them exhumed after the war, sent to places like Richmond's Hollywood Cemetery down into Raleigh uh, and to some other places. From here, we could actually uh, see over top of, if we could see just over top of Cemetery, Ridge. It's a little bit far in the distance. We'd have the Jacob Hummelbaugh farm. That is where William Barksdale will, will uh, uh, end up. He's wounded out here. Evan talked about him a little bit earlier. Hummelbaugh is placed at the Hummel 
sorry, Barksdale is placed at the Hummelbaugh farm in the care of some of the surgeons of the 148th Pennsylvania. Um, a musician named Robert Cassidy will actually tend to Barksdale in his final hours. Barksdale dies on July 3rd, 1863, mortally wounded out here uh, on the fields of Gettysburg. But if you read a regimental history from a New York regiment who fought against Barksdale in 1864, they write a line, and this comes right out of the war, and you could see how hostilities are still, uh, and the hackles are up uh, between North and South, and these men talk about Barksdale dying on the crimson fields of Gettysburg without even a slave to bring him a cold cup of water. Well, ironically, over at the Hummelball farm is Robert Cassidy, a musician in 148th Pennsylvania, and he is actually going to be tending to Barksdale, giving him whiskey and also giving him water. And he will help to inter Barksdale's body and get word to his widow where he is buried specifically on the Gettysburg battlefield. He's eventually exhumed and I believe he is now in Magnolia Cemetery in Mississippi. Um, so this is a human tragedy that takes place and unfolds here at Gettysburg. And on November 19th of 1863, Edward Everett, the greatest orator in the land came up here and he gave a rousing speech for an hour and 57 minutes. He got the crowd worked up. He brought people back to 1863, back to July. He talked about all of the battle that took place out here. And then he turned over the lectern to Abraham Lincoln in, in 292 words and 10 sentences, basically s smashed Edward Everett in, in uh, what we think of in history today. People at the time thought Everett was great, but today we remember Abraham Lincoln's 292 words. And as our friend Doug Dowd says, he time travels with us. He takes us back to the founding of the nation at the Declaration of Independence, brings us up into this war and what's it's all about, and then eventually the outcome in those 292 words. And that's why we're out here today, to remember the actions that took place here at Gettysburg, but not just at Gettysburg, but about that great task that was before them that was still lying ahead. And no one would know that this war was still going to go on until 1865 here in the midst of it. So that's one of the the, the main main reason we're up here is to remember the soldiers who were up here, remember that great speech of Abraham Lincoln, and to come out here onto the landscape just like Edward Everett and others would do to learn from this battlefield. And we hope that you'll learn more at battlefields.org uh, about what happened here specifically at the Peach Orchard. Anybody have anything they would like to add? All right, it looks like we are uh, going to close off our Remembrance Day coverage. We want to thank you for joining us today. Check out our YouTube channel once again if you missed the Remembrance Day Parade. We covered that um, earlier. That'll be over on our YouTube channel. We had some other lives that we did earlier today on Facebook. Check those out as well. But thank you for supporting battlefield preservation and education up here at Gettysburg. And check out everything that we have from maps to animated maps to our appeals that we have going on right now here at Gettysburg to try to preserve about a half acre up at the south end of the town at a place called Pickett's Buffet. We're trying to preserve that land and bring that uh, back to the way it looked in 1863. So on behalf of the American Battlefield Trust, Evan Portman behind the camera, Doug Ullman, Sarah K. Byerly, I'm Chris White. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting battlefield preservation and education.